من یه نبر با نیم بار خانم گیم خیلی جناب داری گیم از نیم کشکر دارم بدرم Once again, please allow me to thank uh, Ms. Lindbergh, Ms. Hope. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I would like to sincerely say that uh, we are very happy or from the yesterday's iftar that we had say, here in USIP. Thank you very much. So, uh, I know that our, our, uh, our other guests would like to have a chance to, to say some things, but in the interest of making this uh, as much of a conversation as we can, I'm going to do that in the form of a question. Um, and I know that you have you know, talking points that you'd like to get through, but I'm going to ask you um, what I think is one of the most interesting questions based on what we saw um, uh, two weeks ago uh, in, um, in Samarkand, uh, the uh, Imam al-Bukhari Center, which was created sort of in the space of two years at the initiative of President Mirza Yoyev. Um, I'm, I'm impressed that, you know, Uzbekistan is a country that is secular, <coughs> Uh, and, and welcomes all religions and its, its organization. But it's also, as we saw in, in, in Samarkand, a center of Islamic civilization with a rich history. And uh, I'd like to ask a question, a very, I think, for us, interesting and basic question about what the role of the state, uh, in this case, the, the, the Uzbek state, is uh, in supporting and encouraging Islam as a unifying uh, force not just for Uzbekistan, but for the, the larger region. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairperson, uh, Excellencies, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It's my <coughs> great honor to speak to this distinguished audience. And I'm happy to see many of the, my familiar faces and my old friends as Chris Seipel, Knox, Tans, Steve Sverlov, uh, Salim, and Nabahar, uh, also. Uh, I am a great honor. And I, uh, first of all, stress that we can see that uh, today's meeting is a continuation of the international uh, round table religious tolerance, the experience of Uzbekistan and uh, United States held in September last year in Tashkent with the participation of the Ambassador at Large uh, for International Religious Freedoms, uh, Ambassador uh, Brownback, and the Honorary President of the Institute for Global Involvement, Chris Seipel. It's, uh, it's very logically a continuation. You are uh, absolutely right, uh, Uzbekistan is a secular state. The state and religion is separate. It's very important. And uh, according to the Constitution of Uzbekistan, the establishment of political parties on the religious basis is prohibited also. We are secular state, by we are based on uh, a rich Islamic culture and civilizations. And look, this is the first point. The second, historically, Uzbekistan is, uh, is one of the um, centers of world civilization and the uh, crossroad of the Great Silk Road. Uh, and uh, region characterized, Uzbekistan characterized by the interethnic, interreligious, intercultural, and interlinguistic tolerance of the people who live in Uzbekistan. So many of characteristic features of today's Uzbekistan. And state uh, supported all of the religious confessions. As stated, uh, Grand Mufti, in Uzbekistan exist 16 religious confessions, more than two uh, 2,200 uh, religious organizations. And uh, the 
uh, inter-religious tolerance is more important for our state. And uh, state uh, pay great attention for the equality of all the religious organizations. And today, is, uh, uh, according to the recommendations and uh, according to the recommendations of Special Rapporteur UN Ahmed Shahi, we prepare the new version of law on religious organizations. And the main uh, futures, first of all, uh, the correlations between the state and religious organizations. And uh, we uh, adopted many recommendations about our, our American partners. And, and uh, uh, I think it's more important today we discuss all of the problems. <coughs> One of the things that uh, stood out about the meetings that we had a few weeks ago uh, in, in Tashkent and Samarkand was that we had representatives uh, from uh, the governments of the region and from civil society in the region. And um, I'd like to offer uh, Susan Hayward, uh, our senior advisor for religion and inclusive societies here at USIP, a chance to ask uh, a question and make some comments uh, for you to respond to. Wonderful. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, welcome to all of our guests from Uzbekistan and all of our guests here today. It's great to see a lot of familiar faces from the world of religious peace building and, and interfaith dialogue, um, as well as some of the new faces from Central Asia that are new to me. So uh, as Gavin said, I'm from the religion program at USIP, which is our, our oldest thematic program. And we do a lot of work to, to understand the religious dimensions of conflict and to support intra and interfaith dialogue, conflict mitigation, skills building for religious leaders, and encouraging state policies and practices that foster religious freedom and non-discrimination. We also have an, an ongoing practitioner exchange that looks at the intersection of uh, countering violent extremism and religion. We do this in partnership with the Religious Freedom Office and the Counterterrorism Office at, at the State Department. And that relationship between the two is far more complicated than, than many folks assume um, at first blush. And, and, and what we seek to do is, is probe that complexity in order to surface some recommendations about how to engage in, in religious spaces in order to prevent and, and counter violent extremism. And among the many topics we explore in this exchange is, is one on the relationship between religious freedom and state efforts to promote religious tolerance through uh, ministries of religion or other state-sponsored institutions. And, and we recognize, too, that that's a very complicated intersection, particularly in places like Uzbekistan, where there are good efforts that are being made to promote and advance religious freedom in the midst of ongoing security concerns uh, about violent extremism, as Nancy noted at the beginning. So as Gavin said, I recently joined my colleagues from the Central Asia team in Tashkent and Samarkand for this, this regional discussion on efforts to promote religious tolerance as, as part of larger efforts to prevent and counter violent extremism. And this was my first visit to the region, I have to admit. So, so I offer these few points of reflection with a great deal of humility, recognizing there's still much for me to learn about the context. So first, I was very struck, as Gavin was too, about um, the, the pride, the regional sense of pride in the historic expression of Islam in Central Asia. And I think you've heard some of that today from the reflection from the Grand Mufti. These are traditions that may have been muted during Soviet rule, but which have an enduring legacy that has much to offer in the current moment. An Islam that offers critical lessons in support of pluralism within Islam, but also across religious traditions, and a rich scholarship. It, these are, these are uh, legacies and treasures that uh, I think can offer benefit not just to Uzbekistan or to Central Asia, but, but for the wider world. And there was something that was really unifying and edifying about seeing um, clearly for those across the region who were there, um, especially when they visited the sacred city of Samarkand, that, that pride in the indigenous uh, Central Asian Islamic expression and practice. This is particularly at a time when there seems to be a lot of rediscovering of, of faith, religious ideas, and, and practices, this revitalization of faith after, after many years of religious uh, repression. 
So I, I want to note with appreciation um, a lot of a lot of work that the that the government has been doing in order to revitalize this indigenous tradition through theological training and scholarship through the the various institutions that the Grand Mufti was was referring to, um, and. This is critically important, particularly because it ensures that the people of Uzbekistan and the region don't need to go elsewhere in order to receive that theological training. And I think that's, that's very critical, right? Because it, at present, a lot feel that they need to go to Al-Azhar or they need to go to other centers outside of the region in order to, 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 to access this kind of theological training. So the idea that this kind of rich training can be offered in the region, I think, was, was a source of a great deal of enthusiasm for many who are there. And, and uh, I in commend and encourage as well the, the uh, possibility of those kinds of theological trainings being equally offered to, to, to women and men. And I say that as a woman who is theologically trained and, and I'm grateful for that so that I can keep up with the Imam Majids and the Imam uh, Sharifs and the, and the Pastor Bobs of the world. Um, and, and I also encourage you to ensure that there are skills and applied work that is being done in those, in those centers of theological training as well. The, the Grand Mufti spoke about the importance of knowledge and enlightenment. In Buddhist understanding, um, enlightenment, and I can't help but think of Buddhism when I use the word enlightenment, but in Buddhist understanding, enlightenment comes through both wisdom and practice in equal measure. So it's through actions and through the, the knowledge um, that you are able to reach enlightenment. And so in that, in that, um, in that same way, I think ensuring that, that the future generations of religious leaders, male and female, in Central Asia are able to develop both the theological understanding and the knowledge as well as the skills to be able to, to help respond to the needs of their communities and advocate on behalf of their communities is, is going to be critical. Um, and to that end, I was also very impressed by the civil society groups from across the region who are, who are also involved in, this, in, this, in these efforts to promote religious coexistence um, within Islam and between the various religious and ethnic groups, including through the development of, of curriculum and so on has demonstrated again and again worldwide and as affirmed by USIP's recent task force on preventing violent extremism, civil society is critical for preventing violent extremism. The state cannot do it alone, as we know. And civil society is also very critical for advancing religious freedom, the specific topic we're discussing today, working in collaboration with the state but also independent from it in order to ensure that, that these civil society actors uh, are seen as legitimate and are seen as caretakers for and advocates of their own communities. I think that's particularly crucial when it comes to religious actors. So the, the, the degree to which there's diverse civil society participation in developing and reviewing and, and implementing these policies related to both religious freedom and, and preventing violent extremism. And here I mean diversity, not just across religious traditions, but also across generations and across genders and so on, I think is, um, is, is, is critical to ensure that they are uh, representative of the, the various priorities and needs of communities and, and are bought into and are sustainable by, by all. So again, these are just some, some short, humble reflections that I offer from my time there. And, and, and I want to, to note that, that these multiple efforts by Uzbekistan to advance religious freedom, to revitalize an indigenous expression of Islam, and to prevent violent extremism and ensure security for the state and for the society. I hope that they will continue to advance in, in mutual support of one another, because they are very much mutually reinforcing when developed uh, in, in tandem or, or in cooperation. But when they are, they, they, can, they can compete with one another. And I recognize that this is not an easy tension to, to navigate, but I suspect many here, I know many here, and certainly USIP uh, are eager to, support, to, to continue to support Uzbekistan as it, as it walks along this path. And in the spirit of what Gavin uh, invited me to do in asking a question, I, I would like to ask to, to go back to the role of civil society. Um, how are all of you partnering with civil society, and what are you seeing as the contributions from the diverse constituencies within civil society in the efforts to advance religious freedom in particular? Thank you uh, for this it's a very interesting question. Uh, today in Uzbekistan, uh, there are 
9,000 non-governmental organizations function, more than 9,000. And in order to fundamentally enhance the rule or an importance of civil society institutions in the comprehensive and advanced development of the country, to strengthen their interaction with government bodies, the advisory council for the development of civil society was created last year, according to the uh, decree of president on uh, May for uh, on uh, May uh, uh, last year. And uh, we also adopted uh, two new, uh, main uh, laws, a law on social partnership and law on social, uh, uh, social control. And according to the law on social partnership, uh, st uh, the state and uh, civil society organization is it's a, it's a, uh, uh, cooperated on the legal basis. And uh, the rule of uh, NGO strengthened in the sphere of social control. Now, um, uh, in each state body, we establish uh, councils uh, with the participation of civil society organizations. This is uh, one of the indicators of uh, social uh, partnership between the state bodies and, and non-governmental bodies. And I said this is more important. This is uh, one of the uh, priority directions of the strategy of action uh, adopted by President of Uzbekistan, uh, Mr. Mirziyoyev. And I think I think uh, we uh, changed the laws concerning the uh, uh, process of registration, uh, monitoring, and and and. Uh, <coughs> And uh, we think our concept is implemented to increase the legal culture in the society also. Uh, but uh, the uh, country has taken additional measure to strengthen national human rights institutions also, uh, bringing them into line with international standards. Uh, according to the recommendations of the international uh, and uh, UN treaty bodies, we increased the role to uh, uh, now Uzbe in Uzbekistan. Uh, there are four national human rights institutions. The first, uh, parliamentary ombudsman. The second, national human rights uh, center. The third, business ombudsman. And now, a month ago, we created the new uh, ombudsman, ombudsman for uh, children. This, uh, for, uh, this uh, I think, is a more important breach between the uh, society and, and uh, state and national human rights institutions also. Thank you. Um, so before I open this up to uh, general questions, I had a question that um, I think comes very much from this experience we had of seeing Tajiks and Kyrgyz, uh, Kazakhs and Turkmen in Samarkand uh, embracing this, this common culture. Um, you mentioned that you had um, students who were who were leading prayers in, in, in Russia, Malaysia, New Jersey. And if I'm not mistaken, um, President Mizuyoyev's first trip uh, abroad was to Moscow to talk about, with Mr. Putin, about labor migration and labor migrants and the Uzbeks who were uh, abroad in the diaspora. Um, is there a role for the religious institutions in Uzbekistan in reaching out to those Uzbek populations in uh, in Tajikistan, in Kyrgyzstan, in Kazakhstan, and uh, even further abroad in Russia, uh, the labor diasporas uh, that exist. What what should the role of Uzbekistan and those religious institutions be with those populations? Uh, я сейчас заменила вам директор центра исламской цивилизации, ну попробую ответить на этот вопрос. Да, действительно, в соседних республиках и в России у нас значительное количество узбекской диаспоры. Of course, there is a big diaspora of uh, our country in our neighboring countries and in Russia. В соседних республиках исторически у нас проживают 
разное количество узбеков, этнических узбеков. Historical there have been a significant number of ethnic Uzbeks living in our neighboring countries. Значительное количество проживает и в Афганистане. Узбеки есть и в Афганистане, они тоже исторически этнические узбеки. And there's also historically big number of Uzbek diaspora living in Afghanistan. А в России узбеки, их количество увеличилось из-за временного, значит, поиска места работы. So the number of our diaspora in Russia increased due to the temporary search for work. Всем хорошо известно, что исчезновение Советского Союза привело к разрыву экономических отношений и у всех республиках бывших советских ныне независимых появились временные трудности в области места работы, занятости. So we 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 know that after the end of the Soviet time, the the economic link, economic connectivity between post-Soviet countries, they disappeared, and there were temporary difficulties in finding jobs. Скажу сразу, что вот начиная с этого года уже наблюдается уменьшение наших мигрантов в России. I have to note right away that from this year the number of Migrants to Russia is decreasing. У нас все идет к тому во всех областях вы прекрасно осведомлены, что очень бурными темпами развивается экономика во всех областях, в том числе в области строительства, куда уже вовлечены очень многие наши бывшие мигранты в России. So in in all spheres of our economy, there is a very big increase in economic increase. And as part of it, many migrants that used to work in Russia, they are now engaged in the construction work in Uzbekistan. В смысле религии, религиозных свобод, влияния религии, с соседними республиками у нас среди узбекской диаспоры как таковых проблем нет, потому что соседние наши республики, они исторически тоже исповедуют ислам по большей части, поэтому там как таковых проблем не было и нет сейчас. So I have to note that in terms of cooperation on religious basis with our neighboring countries, we do not see any issues. So historically we have we have the common heritage and we have the same religion. Но с усилением влияния террористических и экстремистских идей вообще по всему миру все мы хорошо знаем, что происходило, происходит в Афганистане, Ираке, Сирии и так далее, вообще по всему миру. Конечно, наблюдалась и наблюдается попытка со стороны экстремистических группировок, движений, именно нести влияние и влияние именно экстремистских идей среди диаспоры, узбекской диаспоры в России. Были такие случаи. And um, I I should note that uh, we can see the different touristic and extremism ide ideologies from uh, Iraq, Syria, and other countries uh, trying to make efforts in order to uh, make some kind of effect in our in uh, inside the diaspora, inside the Uzbek diaspora in Russia. И uh, управление мусульман Узбекистана, молодежные наши организации. Парламент республики, очень многие вовлеченные, заинтересованные организации начали заниматься этим вопросом. И мы, так как мигранты это в основном молодежь, мы начали работать с молодежью, которая была подтверждена идеям или чувствительна идеям экстремизма и терроризма. И положительные результаты определенные были получены. Also, in order to tackle this issue, together with the Muslim Board of Uzbekistan, Parliament and youth organizations, we have developed several separate plan and we are uh, doing separate actions in order to uh, work with the fragile, uh, fragile population, which is the uh, youth migrants. And uh, so far, we have already obtained several very good positive results. First, 
First of all, uh, migrants, they, uh, they could feel the attention by the government of Uzbekistan. So they are not only just uh, forgotten. Были дополнительно созданы наши консульские учреждения во многих регионах России. So we have also additionally opened several new consulate offices in Russia. Которые усиленно занимаются в том числе соблюдением прав наших мигрантов в России. So they uh, they work strongly on uh, monitoring the interests and rights of our migrants in Russia. И конечно наши имамы ведут вели просвещенческую деятельность, то есть объяснить истинный смысл, истинную суть ислама. Of course, our imams they have been closely working with our migrants in order to uh, enlighten in, in, in give the enlightenment of the true essence of Islam. А суть ислама никак не связана ни с терроризмом, ни с экстремизмом. Это мир, созидание и толерантность. And the essence of Islam is, uh, cannot be anyhow connected with terrorism. Uh, it is only peace, uh, harmony, and uh, tolerance. Thank you very much. So, so now I want to open it up to general questions. Uh, I have a couple of requests. The first request is that you identify yourself when you ask your question. The second request is that you keep your questions succinct uh, and make sure there's a question mark at the end. There was also one comment. Oh, 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 please. <coughs> yeah. Sorry, just, uh, I'm the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Senate of Uzbekistan, but I just wanted to, to add about the, the our clerics going to Russia and other places. In my days in South Korea, and we have quite a big number of Uzbek migrant workers in South Korea as well, we received as an embassy a request from representative of our nation to send them imam from Uzbekistan. So it is not necessarily from top to bottom process than the religious uh, communities or religious committee or either Muslim boards and someone. It's also a process then pious Muslims, Uzbeks, who are willing to pray according to our, I would say, tariqat and interpretation and to be freely speak Uzbek language are seeking support and the Muslim board supports it. It is not necessarily only preventive measure against the terrorism or something else. It is an important. And if we look at number of people who at latest they joined ISIS or whatever, they never been from Uzbekistan. Yes, they've been subject to this certain brainwash outside Uzbekistan. And we're doing a lot to get those people back and just to add to what Ambassador Minawar said, Yesterday, President of Uzbekistan signed a new degree where the government will be building a huge chain of textile factors which will be given to local producers. And again, it's our policy to give people job, a decent job in Uzbekistan and not to face a lot of hardship, including with some religious hardship as well. Thank you.